and welcome to another edition of Island Stat Sports Show here on Island Stat. Uh, joining me today is, as you can tell, Mr. Gary Coys Moreno and Jason Juggling J. Ford. Um, gentlemen, we uh, have, we're into our second show. Um, good things for today. But um, give us a sense of how your week has been, um, Gary. We know you're, you're a very important man outside of this show. But how, how has your week been? Important to the wise dog, because I buy the dog food. But anyhow, um, so far, so good, mate. You know, just following up on what's happening in the sports world, I see that that guy, Rui, what's his name, the Portuguese hacker, who broke all those major stories about the different uh, football organizations and stuff, he might be facing 25 years for leaking information. Um, so that's, of course, you know, I'm a big news guy, so following all the, the news activities. So that's one of the major things I've been looking at. The NBA might be going back to playing games in the ESPN Sports Center in Florida, I think it is. Jason, you're a world traveler. You would know where that is. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be a Disney Disney. 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 What, what, what? It will be at Disney. Yeah, is that, there you go. Um, and it's going to be, um, I think it's just going to be the playoffs, if I'm not mistaken. They're not going to go back to the rest of the regular season. I don't know how that's going to work, but we'll see. Of course, the Bundesliga is back on. The games that I've seen so far have all been one-sided. But the big clash is today. Still trying to find where I can see that. Um, I don't know if it's going to be carried on cable or if I'm going to have to go next door by the neighbor and see it on their streaming TV. Um, yeah, that's about it, you know, um, waiting for the Premier League to start back, Jason, so we could all look at the best team in the world. Come on, you Spurs! Well, now, actually, the weekend was actually good, to be honest with you. You'd like to see a little bit of, like I said, more sports opening up um, with that golf match between uh, Tom Brady and... That's going to be interesting. And, ...and Tiger Woods and Mickelson over the weekend. That was something in torrential rain. Yeah. We thought all this yep. build up, and then it was torrential rain. But to see that match, I mean, as much as you would think that it's, it's for charity, it's for fun, you can see the competitive side with these athletes are all from athletes, my man. There's nothing about when it comes to competition, it those matter. juices begin to flow. It's like, forget about the charity and all of that. I'm here to win. It doesn't matter. And, and, and it just... We're saying, that actually, that's what we were saying about sports returning last week, Dave, and we were talking about the fact that the Bundesliga has started and social distancing is going right out the door because one, you want it in. Two, it's only one ball you're chasing and everybody wants it. And everybody wants to put it away. So it's 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 those juices. Once they get flowing, forget all the rules and regulations of 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 social distancing and not wanting to hug each other and all that. And even when a girl scored, it's excitement. It, that's yeah. What you can. And, I, and Aaron, and I think, right, and as we mentioned last week, I think that's the biggest dilemma with all these sports opening up. Is once you open it up, it's hard to hold back. Feel it's hard to hold back. When people must celebrate. It's hard to hold back. So the only thing they can do is really protect the fans from it because they know the players are going to get together. They're going to, you yeah. know, yeah. they're going to do different things. That's inevitable. You know? And that's just because of the, the way the sports are. It, no matter if it was even bowling, you know, you see the bowlers go and high-five each other. What are they going to do now? Wave or from a distance? <laughs> but it's interesting because looking at the Bundesliga game on the weekend, guys are coming over and, like, you know, just bouncing their arms. At one point, two players were about to hug and they thought, you know what, like they had second thoughts and then they just went, like, look at this nonsense. But emotions. But two minutes later, they'll be in a tackle together, rolling over together. <laughs> <laughs> so what sense does it make? You know, it's a non it's, 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 a, it's a nonsense. That's what it is. <laughs> what's that? Um, what's that group in Bermuda that had? Um, you have the balloons around you and you're playing football. What? What? Um, Gary should know that. What? Why should Gary know that? You know what? If you don't, if listen, you need to come in the middle because this is going to turn into a boxing match real soon. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. You're going to need to be a ref, me. Yeah, it's like best I think it's going to be on the right side, right side only because <laughs> at some point in time, when this season resumes, do you two have to play each other? Does Does United have, have Tottenham to play? I think well, it, you can refer to it as play. United has. You, United has to be beaten by Tottenham. That's how I see it. So you know what that means? What? They didn't beat us earlier. 
Hey, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> don't worry about that. Well, the first game is for ladies. First, we're just testing you guys up. Soften you up for the slaughter. That's what it's all about. Don't worry about it. Come on, you Spurs. Um, on to today's show. Obviously, later this evening, we will find out, or hopefully this evening or tomorrow, um, we will find out what the results of the meeting, of uh, the, the special congress that the Bermuda Football Association are hosting at this time with their member clubs um, to, do, to come up with a way to end the 2019-2020 season. Um, the deadline of May 17th of, of getting anything started has gone, and uh, the, the chances of finishing the season by the end of May is definitely out. So um, we, we now look at what, what possibly could be the outcomes of, of the remainder of the season. So we, we, we wait with anticipation on how this, this all resolves itself. And we know in any democracy, there's going to be um, a group that say yay and, and some that say nay. But hopefully at the end of it, everybody feels as if their voice is heard and they had the opportunity to express themselves and then the decision is, 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 is revealed. So what's your thoughts, Jason, on on how this will play out? Like I mentioned before, I, there's no time table when it comes to amateur sports. You know, we try to put time table on amateur sports. There's no real money involved in it. So if a season overlaps another season as far as another sport, I should say, it shouldn't be much of a difference. And, uh, we mentioned it last week with especially football or soccer, some will call it. But in our, in our country, it's been social distancing for a while. So <laughs> as far as, uh, yeah, and, and, and fans. So as far as being a, a detriment to the fans, I don't think there's much of an issue there. Um, obviously, they doesn't have to take the protocols from the government of the day to see exactly what they're allowed and what they're allowed not to do. But as far as having the games, I just think instead of just having having the meaningful games, the games that actually mean something, just, you know, the games that don't mean anything, summer break, take a break. And to be honest with you, like we had mentioned last week, a lot of these players play two sports, the seasonal players, seasonal athletes. So while football season's in, they will play football. When cricket season's in, they will play cricket. Most of these guys who play cricket, um, basically that's switched off from football already. So we've seen that over the years, even when teams are going into the FA Cup final, uh, you know, you're missing some players. Say, okay, why? Because they had a cricket game that day, you know? So it's going to be all cricket training or whatever the case would be. So I think these games will be played. I just think the, the meaningful game should be played and just, hey, just make it as simple as possible. The only thing I just want to point out, and we had mentioned earlier last week, and I saw a story this week uh, in EPL, there's a study coming out saying there's approximately maybe about 25% chance of injury having so many games in a short period of time, not having a good leading. And we had mentioned that last week, that could be some of the problems before starting the league. How do you get these players up to, you know, up to fitness level, especially at an amateur level where, you know, you don't have the trainers and the physios and all the other different things, you know, these professional outfits have. Speaking about that, I see Zlatan was injured in training, and they're saying it could be a career-ending injury. Another career-ending. <laughs> another another career-ending injury. But we we know these Zlatan how he bounces back from these things. But coming back to what we were just discussing here, the local league. Remember, some of these players are two sport athletes. You know, some of them play both cricket and football. Some uh, Malachi Jones, for instance. So to say that it won't affect one or the other might be a misnomer because. But also, I also agree with you that we should just play the meaningful games. But we might also consider just deciding, look, season is done. We know villages already won the season. So what's the sense in continuing? Just a point on the champions, move on, scrap the rest of the season, and start afresh next year? Well, there was a report um, earlier when, when, the, when the lockdown first started. Um, Gary, your team started to do some training and got in a little bit of trouble. They were trying to be ahead of the game. Uh, what's your thoughts on <laughs> the coach hosting those training sessions in the park? Listen, my coach is an innovator. My coach is way ahead of his time. And when you understand that, you will understand the thinking of the maestro that he is. Other coaches follow the trend that is set by him. But he took a chance. He got caught. 
Mm. Taking that getting caught is easier, no, not taking the chance. <laughs> if you get caught, then you have to answer. It's better to do and then ask, then say you're sorry than to ask permission. That's how you were taught with the man. So, you know, he got caught and he had to stand the consequences. But seriously, we're living in unprecedented times. And he was, as you say, trying to get ahead of the game, pun intended. And it was a, a risky move and perhaps an ill-advised move. And he paid, they're gonna pay they're gonna pay a price for that, as they already have. But in the grand scheme of things, trying to get his players fit for the starter or for the continuation of the season, whatever form that might take, and, and can you really fault him for that? All right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll have more of the Island Stack Sports Show. Welcome back to the Island Stats Sports Show. I'm your host, Earl Baston. and joining me again is uh, Gary Coys Marino and Jason Juggling J. Ford. Well, gentlemen, um, as we see Bermuda and the rest of the world starting to um, sort of relax the, the rules and regulations uh, and allow people back in, um, we, we've seen what sports have been allowed the shackles to be taken off of some um, we know uh, swimming has has been one of those ones, obviously uh, open water, not necessarily in the pool as of yet. Um, they they were due to go to Carifta Swimming Championships, our swimmers as well as CC Can um, got a chance to speak with national coach Ben Smith about how things slowly are getting back to somewhat of a norm um, for the sport of swimming and our swimmers. So let's go to that interview with. Yeah, with Ben Smith. Well, Ben Smith, um, we go into phase two of the government's uh, plan to um, kind of reopen the country. Um, what, what, um, how does this affect or how does this help uh, the sport of, of swimming? So what I'll say is the, the first thing that happened, um, there was a quick relief that we had access to the water. And what I mean by that is open water. So most people started to do swimming from dock, swimming from the beach. Um, there's been quite a bit of beach training, organized beach training, because you can have a group of 10. So that allows for a coach and nine athletes using social distancing for, you know, on beach, on land training, and then being able to do some stuff in the water. Um, that's that was the initial kind of start. As soon as we were able to have access to the water, uh, swimmers not having access to the water for all that time and shelter in place made it really difficult. Um, I don't know if this has ever happened before to have swimming worldwide shut down, right? I mean, no one was actually having any access. So that was step one. I spent some time putting together a proposal to give to government on how we could move into uh, opening swimming facilities. And um, there are some countries that have started to kind of do that. There are some regulations around it. Um, 
I, I presented that to them. They're they're in the process of going through it. Uh, I've actually spent some time dealing with our our regional partners to to figure out what is the the safest way to reopen facilities um, that would allow swimming kind of in some way the way it used to be um, for for a six lane twenty five meter pool. In the past, you know, a practice would have six swimmers in one lane, so 36 swimmers total in the pool. That's that's a completely different setup from what's possible now. So uh, I know that you attended that practice right before we went into shelter in place, and I was telling you that I was trying to come up with different ways to actually have a normal practice, you know, staggering the swimmers. You could have one person finishing at one end, one person finishing at the other end, and and then eventually I tried to have three, one person finishing in the middle. So you could have 18 people in the water, just coming up with different ways to try to have a practice happen. Um, but really you, I need to get as much information as possible that we're gonna make sure that everybody is gonna be safe in that environment. So which version is going to be the one that allows us to come back in a safe way. And uh, so it looks like next Wednesday, um, I will have been able to organize a seminar with our region, along with a representative from the health uh, portion of FINA. They, they will be in on this call, answering all the different questions about, you know, chlorinated water being safe and what is the level of the chlorine, what is the pH level of the pool, what is the what are all the things that we would have to put in place to make it as safe as possible. And the goal is to actually have um, a representative from the government sitting in on that call so that we're all on the same page and can come up with a solution to kind of get back to swim training. All right, so we have an update as far as a plan to try and move forward as far as getting back to swim training. So um, good luck in the meeting. Um, I know your, your counterparts are probably all got a list of questions, so you might have to limit yes. it. <laughs> Yeah. Person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it, it's good that, that the fact that you have the ability to use the open water um, to still use, get get those, um, the motion going and some sort of training going using water. I know it's a lot different uh, open water as opposed to a pool, but uh, at least you can get that, that some sort of training in as far as that water training. Yeah, it's, it's it's actually interesting. The conversations that I've been having with uh, with some of the people that we normally compete with in Carifta and CCGAN, um, different countries are at different stages of this, right? So a lot of people are jealous that we have access to the beaches right now when they haven't had that, right? I mean, that that ability to get to water is, you know, swimmers are hungry to get back to training. And it just, you know, this is the first step. And really, we're just kind of, trying to have them be in a good frame of mind, get back to the water, get back to training. But right now it's baby steps because nobody knows how long it's going to be before we actually can start to have regular organized practices. Um, some states in the U S have some, um, they've, they've loosened some of the restrictions. So some clubs have been able to go back. So at least that's going to give us an idea of what that looks like. Um, but really, you know, beach training step one, but until we get back to that that pool training, we're able to kind of do that part, and then then we'll be figuring out what the goals are going to be. Right? It's been it's been an interesting process trying to keep the athletes motivated when you you have no idea what the target is going to be and when that target's going to happen. Um, most of the competitions around the world have been pushed into the fall. Um, and that's any kind of competition um, with just the hope that we're going to be able to get back to that point. Um, you know, it's going to take at least five weeks of continuous practice before we even start to get to that. Um, but the the ocean swimming, it, it does have, yes, they are in the water. Yes, they do have access to do some proper training, but there has been some, some initial hiccups. Um, Mainly, you know, Portuguese man of war on the South Shore has been a bit of an issue. Um, you know, it's one it's one thing to be a coach standing on the deck of a pool and it's a controlled environment and you're, you know, I know what I'm dealing with, depth of the water, all the rest of it. 
But when you have them swimming up and down and they're disappearing behind the waves and people are coming out and saying they saw a bunch of Portuguese man of war and you got some people screaming because there's some fish underneath them, that's a completely different uh, set of, of rules, right? So um, it's been interesting. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, we've heard from Ben. Um, the, the, the one funny part is we all know we have some strong swimmers in the island, but to know that they're not used to swimming in the open water and, and, and when they look down, they're seeing fish, they're, seeing, they're not seeing a line. It, it, it's something new to them. It's, it's something strange. Um, what did you take from, from Ben talking about how they've been able to get back in the water and some sort of training? I think that Bermuda being blessed with, well, being an island, first of all, and the kind of waters that surround this island, it's been a blessing for these for these athletes because as Ben was saying, they're able to train where other athletes perhaps have not been able to because they don't have the kind of opportunity that they would based on the, 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 the their geographical location and, and, and such. I mean, like there's one athlete in particular, you would know Earl, you know everything sports in this place. Uh, Jesse Washington, I call him Jesse Big Splash Washington. I'm sure he is just I mean, longing to get back into the pool and, and, and do his thing. He is a, an Olympic hopeful for Bermuda, and I dare say he might be able to do something on the big stage. He's making a lot of waves, quote-unquote, in, in the U.S. I think it's uh, he's with the Longhorns, is he? No, um, SMU. Uh, SMU, that's it. Yeah, it is SMU. He's with SMU at the moment. And having the opportunity to train in the waters around here, barring the Portuguese man of war and the fish that they see at the bottom, you know, I think it's a it's a, a good training ground for them. They'll be swimming against the current, so they're going to be building strength. Not that I know anything about swimming <laughs> at all. I just know how to get from one end to the one one end to, uh, to the rocks and back, Jason. You would know about that, and that's about it. But I think that being on being where we're located, the water it's starting to warm up now. The waters are not that rough. The winter season is gone, so the waters are becoming calm now. So the athletes are being able to benefit from that and make the best use of the opportunity that they have now that some of the restrictions have been lifted and they can make use of the parks. You know, as Ben was saying, you don't need to have 15 and 20 of them. You have one coach, nine athletes. You have a sufficient number of athletes. And like I said, enough space to have the, the correct amount of social distancing to allow the athletes to train, perhaps not in the best of conditions, the ideal conditions, that they would like, but they still can do some training. And when the opportunity arises for them to get back into the pool, at least like Jose Mourinho tried to do with my beloved Spurs, they'll have a head start. Yeah, yeah. interesting conversation you guys have. But one thing that pointed really stuck in my mind was the, the mental aspect of these athletes, uh, not just in swimming, but especially in swimming. When you, you mentioned earlier about Carifta being pushed back now to next year, uh, CC can a lot of these events as an athlete training you, you you to get back in the pool or get back in the water that's that's known for you that's where that's where you feel safe that's where you feel comfortable that's where you but you're always looking for training to something training for a competition training for you know an event and the unknown of not know when the next event will be and we mentioned in sports especially in track and field it's always trying to be peak at the right time for the event. So how does our swimming association help out with the mental side of the athletes in preparing and just trying to keep the mental strong as well as the physical strength? I don't know if I agree with you there, Jason, with athletes train, training to an event. I think what makes some athletes stand out is that desire, whenever the bell rings, that they're going to be ready. So they put in that time and that effort. They know mentally that they have to be prepared, as I said, when that bell rings. So they try to always keep themselves on point. When Flora Duffy comes home, in much resting, you yeah. see Flora yeah. Duffy running, you see her on her bike, you see her in the water, not necessarily because there's a competition coming up, but she knows when the season starts, the other athletes, they've already been preparing. Mm -hmm. So she has to make sure she's at that level for when the season starts so that when the bell rings, she's ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. No, I agree with you on that point, but what I'm, I'm, what I, what I'm really referring to 
we talked about um, last week when we talked about track and field, when you have the Olympics and the World Championship and this. And that's some, some of those athletes have a rigorous training uh, regime leading into those events. And then once those events finish, they sort of ease back on the training regime and, and, and try to gear it back up to the next one. So if you ask some of these guys who would have been preparing this week for the May 24th race, well, May 29th, whatever you want to call it now, but they would have been preparing, they would have been doing a lot more, uh, the regime would have been structured to this event. Now, whether it be put them more miles, whether they do heels, whether they do speed, things of that nature. What I'm saying now, when you don't have an event that you're looking at, that's not all, that's, that's, that's not for all sports. Some sports are different. Like you say, with football and different things, like you just want to just play, play, play. Boxing is another one. You see MMA. You're seeing guys just fight. Okay, lineups change and they just still fight. They're just fighting to fight. But when you're looking at, like I said, some, some sports are predicated on when that event is and they want to be at the uptermost physically and mentally at that time. All right. Well, we want to wish our swimmers all the best, obviously, um, and any other sport that, that starts to get going. Um, and, and, and as Gary, you, you have said, be prepared. Be ready to answer that bell whenever whenever that, that, that you hear that sound. And keep an eye on Jesse Big Splash Washington. I'm telling you, that boy is going to do big things for this country. Yeah. Yeah. Earl, a quick note for you, Earl. Has there been a confirmation on what they're going to do with the age limit? for next year's Carifta? Well, both Carifta Swimming and Carifta Track and Field are age group um, centered around, uh, but no, they haven't come up with that idea or, or haven't released um, how they will work out those age groups, only because um, there's, there's got to be a buy-in from everybody, from every country, because, I mean, just imagine if you were 19, um, this would have been your last Carifta track and field. If you were 18, this could be your last Carifta swimming championship. Um, but next year, you'll be 19. And, and do you do you lose out one year because of, you know, world stoppage? So um, there's a lot of talk in both sports. Um, as I said last week, uh, the IOC have already guaranteed the age group disciplines for the Olympics, such as football, um, those that would have been eligible to play in 2020 will be allowed to play in 2021. Uh, but the other sports, uh, we, we have to wait to see um, what the organizations come up with as far as age requirements. So um, we look forward to that. Um, I think it's only, it's only reasonable that they follow the IOC model. Well, yeah, without a doubt. Um, but yeah. We wait, to, we wait to hear from those organizations. I mean, it, it, it would be smart to follow because the IOC are considered the leaders. Um, so, you know, they should be followed. And, and we'll see. The, on, the only, the, the, I guess, what, what many will say is we make our own rules. You know how some, some um, organizations are. We don't, we, don't, we don't follow other people. And it's time to do away with that autonomy nonsense. The wheel has already been, been made. Why try to reinvent it? If the IOC, which is perhaps one of the largest bodies, perhaps second only to FIFA in terms of a sport governing body, has already agreed, look, we're going to allow people who turn 21 or whatever the age age limit is to play next year. Why, why should the, the what, Carifta try to do something different? Right. Why take away that opportunity from uh, an athlete and prevent them from achieving what they would have achieved this year? By, because you simply don't want to follow a precedent that's been set by an international body. You want to have your own autonomy. Come on, man. That's, that's small island thinking. Bush politics. And I, agree, and I agree with you guys. I mean, realistically, it would be a one-off year. So, yeah. Well, you know, we're not talking that something's going to be in place, you know, from here throughout. This would be a one-off year. So Exactly. Yeah, if we're talking about the, the athletes, I mean, we should be thinking for the athletes. That's what we should be thinking about the athletes. This ain't about the officials. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, let's take another commercial break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by our overseas reporters giving us an update on throughout the Caribbean.
Good day, Mr. Kent Fuentes. Again, welcome back to the Island Stat Sports Show. The West Indies right now are looking for a coach, former Bermuda national coach, and 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 Trinidadian Gus Logie has been the interim coach. But what do you see as the future for the West Indies women's cricket as well as the men's? And uh, what else is happening in Trinidad as far as sports moving up? We know that some of the mayors have not allowed their tennis courts to be open. Can we see this in the very near future changing? Right now in Trinidad and Tobago, things remain a bit of the same, um, whereas the um, the Port of Spain and environs, their courts remain closed. The private clubs around the capital have um, begun opening. Also, some of the golf courses in Trinidad and Tobago have begun to open and limiting their golfers to, um, to small amounts, namely, um, from what I've heard from most golf courses, they're limiting to four per group. Also, strict um, adherence to the um, social distancing policies and rules that have been in place for quite some time now. Regarding the West Indies men's and women's team, I haven't heard of anyone that has thrown their hat into the ring for the women's post. I do know here at home there are quite a number of ex-national players have thrown their hat in the race for the Trinidad Tobago coaching position, which is open. It was last held by former West Indies fast bowler Mervyn Dillon. But there are several other Trinidad and Tobago nationals who have had coaching experience and who have been part of the West Indies setup that have thrown their hat into the ring. Um, Riyad Emirates is one of those I know for a fact that have, has thrown his head, his sorry, his hat into the ring. Um, there's the head coach of the Queen's Park Cricket Club, which is the most successful in quite some time, David Furlong. He is the manager, but he is also throwing his hat in the ring for the coaching position. Um, that aside, um, I've spoken to a couple of track and field athletes. Uh, some of them are excited to get back, you know, to use the national facility, the, the stadium. Um, many of them who are based here, who, have, who end up staying home because of the COVID-19 virus, um, have been using the community fields. But to get back onto the track and to do some track work is something they are looking um, forward to. Good day to Earl Baston on Island Starts in Bermuda. This is Vernon A. Springer from the Time Out program on Point FM 99.1 in St. John's, Antigua and Barbuda. Well, in terms of what is happening in the neck of the woods concerning the OECS, you would know that the governments are beginning to relax more or less and go back quietly to a, a, a normal way of life. In Antigua and Barbuda, golf has been relaxed, so folks can be able to go back and play golf, table tennis. Um, in St. Kitts and Nevis, that has not been the norm as yet. In Anguilla, they have totally gone back to their old regime in terms of what's happening. But when we look into the OECS, we really have to give major credit to the St. Vincent and the Grenadines government. And they have done an excellent job with the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cricket Association by having a Vinci T10 tournament, which has been sponsored by an Indian firm out of India. So that has been the main trust of what is happening with cricket. But it's an example where you can be able to now look and see how quietly and how early can cricket begin to start to get back onto its feet in Bermuda, in St. Kitts, in Nevis, in Anguilla, in Trinidad and Tobago. On the other side of cricket, you know, we got some good news. The West Indies will be touring England. So that's a good insight for you. Yes, that's that's on the card and everything is moving at fast pace. So that's good news coming out of St. John's Antigua and Barbuda, the Cricket West Indies headquarters. So that's a good move. In terms of the norms for sports in the Caribbean, it's going to take a little time. I think, first of all, one would also have to trust our governments and the medical health practitioners and the professionals who have done an excellent job so far to curve COVID-19. That is also going to be key. But I think conversations like what we are having now is also going to help um, because it's going to be an education process. So whatever happens in the OECS is going to be key for me to share that with you in Bermuda. And also what's happening in Bermuda is also going to be key for you to share that in terms of what is happening in the OECS, because you would know that a lot of people are still tentative. People are still scared. There's all sorts of information on the media platform, some good, some bad, some negative, you name it. But in the end, I think we have to believe in God. Hey, Earl, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. This is Vernon A. Springer from the Time Out program on Point FM 99.1 in St. John's, Antigua and Barbuda. Anne-Marie, thank you very much for joining us here on Island Stats Sports Show. Barbados has been 
quiet like every other Caribbean country, but how has things evolved since some of the relief has been lifted and things can start to get going again? Hi, Earl. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Well, Barbados is not as quiet as it was before. It's been just over a week now that there has been a relaxation in the restrictions on some sports and sporting activity here on the island. And our sportsmen and women have definitely been capitalizing on it. Golf for one started last week, Monday, and the greens were alive with players we also have running available you can run on the road you can do your jogging and your exercising and our marathon runners have been out and about i've seen them on the roads back into training etc just in case anything starts up later this year tennis both road tennis which is indigenous to barbados as well as tennis they have also been allowed to hit the courts the cyclists the road cyclists are also out and about no more than three cyclists together in a group riding on the road and with the beaches opened our open water swimmers and surfers have been hitting the waves now we have a two-tier system in terms of the sea and being able to go to the beaches you are either allowed to be at the beach or have beach activities between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. And then again, the beaches reopen at 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And they have been utilizing it. But one interesting note is this would have been Rally Barbados week here in Barbados. And Rally Barbados over the years has become one of the biggest all stage motorsport rally events in the western hemisphere we've had competitors come from as far as kenya we have a big concentration of competitors who would have come from the uk with travel restrictions and general restrictions still in place there was no rally barbados physically or in reality but there is rally barbados virtually they've taken to the esport platform and rally barbados attracts some 100 odd drivers every year and this year is no different even though we're now on the e platform and the king of the hill event was actually staged last sunday and when i say stage you could go on facebook and you can actually see our drivers going through the stages assimilated and it was i would say epic to see as we got another view of how our drivers actually maneuver through the courses. We, the organizers of Rally Barbados recreated the event for the e-platform and it has been a hit. It's also allowed fans who always had the wish of being rally drivers to enter because there's no restriction on entry. And ironically, some of the major drivers who come out of the UK like Rob Swan etc have been participating as if they were here for the usual rally Barbados weekend who would usually attract tens of thousands of spectators here on the island so rally Barbados has gone virtual this weekend coming is the all stage rally two days of action it usually is which is the Saturday and Sunday and it'll be done again online virtually so rally fans might not be able to pack the coolers and actually go out onto the streets for the all stage rally but they can at least sit at home and watch Facebook and watch their favorite drivers battle to be Rally Barbados Champions 2020. Also, what is the mood like for the cricket season? Because that was due to get started as well. And with the CPL about to start in a few months, Barbados looking to put together a team. Well, Earl, unfortunately, cricket was not given the green light in the recent relaxation of restrictions on sport. So from the local end of things, the local or domestic season is still a no-go. There's no club level cricket and there's no real training at that level either. However, the Caribbean Premier League where Barbados Striders are defending champions. That is still set to go between August 19th to September 26th. So on paper, the Barbados Stridents are formulating their team and they've gone really with the same team that would have won the title last year, captained by Jason Holder, who's also the West Indies Test Captain. They've included Hayden Waltz Jr., who was the prolific bowler for the team last year you have big hitters in batsmen johnson charles shea hope raymond reefer jonathan carter bowlers ashley nurse the young justin graves and 
of course, the team always has to have an emerging player, a youth player, and they've gone in Naeem Young. So on paper, the Barbados Trident's franchise has started to formulate their team. We're waiting to see how CPL will pan out because CPL is known for the bright vibrancy and the spectatorship and looking to play behind closed doors. We want to see what the 2020 CPL will bring. From the international level, interestingly enough, even though there are no allowances for training at the local level, the West Indies players who are based here in Barbados were actually allowed to take to the nets and to the field at Kansas Novel as they started preparation for the proposed tour to England. Of course, the Cricket West Indies Board and the England Cricket Board are in active discussions as to if they will continue the three-test tour that is set to be played in July. If this does happen, the team has to leave the Caribbean in early June, which is just about next week or so, because they would have to be quarantined for at least two to three weeks in the UK when they arrive. So to kind of dust off the rust that would have you know accumulated during the lockdown period some relaxation and some restrictions were eased so that the West Indies players were able to take to the field at Kensington and in the nets of course this came with restrictions every player had to have his own ball any returns of the ball would would you had to kick the ball back to the the person delivering the ball if you're using the bowling machine you use only your balls and when you finish, you sanitize them. So there were certain restrictions, but the players actually were able to get in some much needed training before they possibly head to England for that proposed tour. So cricket was given a little ease on the international level here on the island. But generally speaking in Barbados, we are Embracing the fact that sports can get some new life back into it. It has been just about three months of lockdown now here on the island. So it is good to see that some sporting activity has been able to occur. So that's it from me here in Barbados. We are just hoping that this pandemic blows over and that we're soon out of it as a world, not only in Barbados, and that, of course, from the sporting end of things, that we get back to those competitions. I miss a football game. I miss a cricket game. I miss a netball game. So I look forward to these restrictions. And thank you so much again for having me on the show. Well, I want to first say thank you very much to Kent Fuentes from Trinidad and our good friend Vernon A. Springer from Antigua and Barbuda. And of course, Anne Marie Burke from Barbados for giving us an update on sports going on throughout their country and around the Caribbean. Um, obviously, in, in, in Trinidad, Gary, you would be interested um, in, in what's going on there, hometown. What did you Hometown take, indeed. What did you take from the from especially Kent's uh, presentation? I think you know golf. It's well, he spoke about a lot of things, but one of the things that stood out to me is his focus on golf. Um, golf is I, well, I don't really follow golf. You know, I mean, except when Tiger Woods started playing. Some might say you know stereotypical reasons, but um, you know, um, I guess. Well, to each their own. But in terms of the cricket, I know that Riyad Emirates, I think he would be an ideal coach for the Trinidad and Tobago program. Uh, the former coach is now looking to go into politics to represent the ruling party. I don't know why athletes would want to leave, leave uh, former athletes would want to get into politics. They should have learned from the situation that occurred with Brent Sancho, who left soccer to go and be the minister of sport in Trinidad and Tobago. That didn't work out too well. So I would advise athletes to leave politics alone and stick to what you know. But um, in terms of the cricket, I think that that is going to be a good move for Trinidad and Tobago if Riyad Emrich were to be appointed the, the coach of the national team. He's a, he would be a player's coach. He's well respected in the cricketing fraternity in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I think only good could come from it. He's going to have the support of the community. That is one thing. He's a, as we say in Trinidad, he's a sweet bread down there. Everybody loves him. So it'll be a good move. And um, taking over from the, the former West Indies pacer, it's, 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 it, it bodes well. It bodes well for the development of the game in Trinidad. Yeah. Uh, Jason, uh, Mr. Springer spoke about the 
uh, cricket in, in St. Vincent. Um, uh, how, how does that look as far as um, things getting going there? Looks promising. It does look promising, and and it's going to be interesting once again. What's what's the guidelines, and and will we will we copy them? You know, and not just for St. Vincent, but for all the islands, really. You know, it's going to be interesting. Who's going to actually take the lead in this? Who's going to get the data? Who's going to get the information? Who's going to make the 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 safest decision? Now, like once again, it's not the players. I hate to say it. Don't ask the players. <laughs> because you know what the players are going to say. Exactly. You know, you know and sometimes, I, I saw this on our story the other day, sometimes, that little cliche saying, sometimes we have to save the players from themselves. Mm -hmm. That's one of, the, this one of these situations. So it's going to be interesting who, what island takes the lead. And I think we, you know, especially when we're talking about small, smaller populations, how do we actually deal with it? And I'm just waiting and see, because I'm pretty sure our BCB is actually probably keeping it close eye on everything going on to our destinations. We'll be back with more of the Island Stats Sports Show after these messages from our sponsor. gentlemen from time to time on this show we will be joined by legends of sport throughout the u.s and uh starting today's legends episode is none other than coach charles hatcher and uh someone we had spoken to earlier in david bascom got a chance to sit down with both of them and talk about um the meaningful impact that the covid 19 pandemic has had it on them and how it, they can reflect back on their careers. Through this pandemic, we've, we've seen um, what used to happen back years ago where people of color were told you can't go out, you can't do this, you can't do that. Now it's global. How do you think your life prepared you and others like you for this pandemic and the restrictions that it put in place for everybody. The the things that we've we've seen and what we do now is so is so 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 impressive that when I came up uh it was in the it was the era of civil rights. There was there was very few, very few opportunities for young African Americans to really uh, get involved in, in, in the swim lane that we were trying to get into. And if it wasn't for me being selected by Reverend Lowry at Abernathy and, and Dr. Martin Luther King, who, who helped us get into this, 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 this era of it, I came up when racism, you know, you're talking about the, 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 the capital of slavery is the, is Virginia, the premise of it right in the Hampton Roads area first slaves dropped in. And man, you know, when um, the apex of, of slavery during the time we were coming up, I mean, all racism when we were coming up, man, what was so was so impactful, this was, had to be a special time for us, for us to be recruited by Dr. Abenaki and Martin Luther King to do what we did, integrate the primary schools in the South, 
was something that's monumental. And what we went through, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, police taking us to classes, bathrooms, and eating, and making sure we got out of there, and t big tar babies, FAGs being hung up on his flagpoles coming out. It was traumatic for a young guy like me, but, you know, we, we were selected for a reason, and we went on through it, and, and, and thank God that uh, I was able to, to come through an era that really opened up and enhanced the opportunity for so many young men now to be able to to do and, and do what they do well as far as uh, under education and education of the higher learning. But sometimes these kids get so distracted off the mainstream of why we did this and the things we went through, then that is something that now at this particular time in this world, they're beginning to understand that you are always gonna be able to do something if you have passion and determination for it because nothing is gonna be given to you in life. Life is a monumental stride for business. It's the business and, and dedication of life. As we say, as David know with the brethren, governing ourselves accordingly does not necessarily mean just on the street is being involved in a day-to-day -day life. It's a 24-hour job being a successful person that wants to be successful in this life. So, you know, you got to be able to, to be in the right swim lanes to be successful. And it's not an easy job. So therefore, when you get guys who have gone through the, the prejudices that we went through and people trying to lynch you for winning a basketball game and your friends getting KKKs cut all their chest, things of that nature like we've seen in my tenure with, with uh, Dr. Richard Lapchick. Man, it, it can scare you. But persevering of those that, uh, that are chosen, uh, they must be able to answer the calls. You hear Coach Hatcher talk about the challenges and so forth, and you, you've, you've had eaten off of them, but how... Oh. how how did your way of coming up and your challenges first getting into the States um, help you through this pandemic and these times? Oh, yeah. So the preparation and, and the journey and when this all started, uh, one of the things that has helped me and I've learned and been able to take away from when I was going through my struggles and in this long journey is being able to overcome fear. Oh, my goodness, yeah. I, I cannot say enough of that the amount of conversations that I've hearing watching the social media and that fear, that fear to kind of uh, change or go outside their natural norms. Uh, people even having fear that, wow, I have to be home with my little people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, man, more often, right? Because we're always sending them to nursery or sending them to school. The fear mm -hmm. of, of having to uh, have conversations, right? You know, mm -hmm. with people that even family that you wouldn't have to have, but you have to now, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. fear of, of making those changes. See, when I came through this this whole journey, I had to adapt very quickly. Mm -hmm. The fear of changing from from actually um, uh, from being in Bermuda, playing outdoor to going indoor. Right. Um, right. What is it going to be like? Not worrying about what people say. See that that fear has grabbed a hold of many people in this time. And, mm -hmm. and it's so important that they understand is that uh, fear has got to go past through you, over you. It's what happens next is where they could jump back into fear is when you need to move. And moving and being successful in that next move means that you have to make change. I had to make change yes. in this space. And if yeah. they're not willing to make change, fear would just linger right outside the door. And they're probably still stuck in the house with mm -hmm. a mask on, trying to put everything out. Listen, this is not, there's no get back to normal. This, we have it's, to, yeah. Normal, right? Once yeah. it's the new norm, look at this, right? All of a sudden, we're having conversations again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. we can't, yeah, we have to, we have to speak to people. Right. We have to actually, you know, because that's now our comfort zone. We couldn't wait to get out of the house to talk to the neighbor now. Right. Right. That's something. Everybody, you know what I said in one of my uh, one of my shows is that you know what is like. It's like 
the big man put everybody under punishment and put mm-hmm. them all in our houses, right? Yeah. It just felt like you're sneaking out and doing <laughs> something wrong, trying to go to the grocery store. You know, yeah. we were put under punishment and so deserved, so mm-hmm. deserved because yeah. we were going all over the place. Everything was out of reach for us. People tried to get things that they couldn't afford. And I'm yeah. not talking about yeah. like physical money things. I'm talking about, you know, and, and then the, the not wanting to reach certain things. Well, I had a chance now to breathe. And if you yeah. come out of this, and if you come out of this and don't make change, then shame on you. Well, I want to thank David, and I want to thank Coach Hatcher. Um, you know, Coach Hatcher is, is well known throughout uh, the world for some of the things that he uh, was able to accomplish from such a young age and still carrying on today. Um, he's, he's a pioneer. Uh, and, and, you know, in talking with him, um, he, he, he's a wealth of knowledge um, and, and just the experiences that he's had has helped a lot of other people, not just people of color, but people throughout sport has, has helped educate them in, in, in life changing um, messages. What did you take from, from Coach Hatcher and, and David? Well, you mentioned that Coach Hatcher is a pioneer. We have a old pioneer here. Of course, and you know the name. Clyde Best. Come on, man. Say the name. Clyde Best. Sir. Clyde Sir. Best. Sir Clyde Best. You know, so I think Bermudians would be able to identify with a lot of what was stated by Coach Hatcher because Mr. Best is a pioneer in his own right to have gone to England. In fact, he was featured in a CNN documentary not too long ago. The ground that he had to break to be one of the first black players to play in the Premier League. He's opened the doors for a lot of black athletes, and I don't think. Bermudians appreciate that fact sufficiently. And that's why I will continue to lobby for a statue to be put up at the National Sports Center, which should actually be the Clyde Bunny Best National Sports Center. That's another debate for another day. But what Coach Hatcher had to say was, was significant in terms of, you know, what he had to endure, what he had to bear in terms of, of breaking into college basketball. Of course, he, I don't think he ever played in the NBA. He went on to play around the world in different right. leagues and such. But these guys were, were pioneers in their own right. They, they, I mean, literally suffered for their sport. You know, similar to what uh, Sir Clyde Best had, had to endure. And, and, you know, to hear them tell their stories, it's more than about kicking a ball or, or shooting a ball. It's about, it's about life for these guys. You know, and you mentioned you were asking about them having to endure shutdowns and that type of thing how would this you know reflect on what they had to do with back then but i don't think the two could compare it's 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 two totally different sets of reasons right. for what mm-hmm. they're enduring now as opposed to mm-hmm. what they had to deal with back then mm-hmm. two things that stood out for me first of all coach hatcher um i commend him and and i respect everything that he has said because a lot of times when great athletes great athletes, it's very hard for them to share their story. And it's, and you barely get to hear some of what, what you know, even if you just, folks have just been watching the last dance in the last couple of weeks and just finishing up, but they've seen a side of Michael Jordan that they've never seen. Mm-hmm. Now we're starting to speak more about the story. I've had a chance to have many conversations with Sir Clyde. And as you guys know, he's a very humble man. And you almost have to pry the story out of him because he's just not forth willing to just give you these stories. And with Coach Hatcher telling you about some of these experiences and, and, and how it was, it, it's, I just, I commend him doing it because we didn't have to wait for him. I hate to say it. He passed and then we got to try to find the story. Yeah. Not yeah. Give us the story and give us the true essence of the story because Gary, you know, as a reporter, you can get, you can get information, you can get stories, but until you get the, the, the source, given the essence of the story, it means a lot. David, David's conversation, fair. And not just when it comes to sports, but when it comes in life. And, you know, for some athletes, that plays a big role. Um, I know athletes, even in our small world, um, who had to, as you know, Earl, have to go to the bathroom before they went out in the field. And that wasn't to do number one or number two. It was... <laughs> It was real the insides because of fear of the competition, and and to you know overcome these things. I saw I knew some athletes when it came to a major game like a cup game, they would just go missing, 
and be wondering, okay, here's one of our best players, but why? Race, I think that's easy. So the fear of the unknown, and some athletes thrive in it, and some athletes don't. So that is something that, um, once again, but you hear people like David had to overcome a lot of his fears, a lot of, you know, even him stuttering. Do you know that David used to stutter bad? I had no idea. <laughs> He talked about a lot where he, he talked had about to a lot. basically teach himself how to present himself without speaking. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. But like I said, the fear of that to, to not become a public speaker. <laughs> you know, so um, that's two great things. And I think lessons that we could just pass on learning through athletes, but just in life in general. If I had one disappointment with David is that he's holding on to what's left on top there. You know, it's let it go, bro. He, let it go, David. Come over to the dark side, David. Let, let it go, go, brother. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time here tonight on Island Stat Sports Show. Um, I do want to remind folks that uh, tomorrow night will be the first edition of Remembering When. Uh, last night was the first edition of the Captains that featured Jacoby Robinson and Lionel Can uh, in their battle up at Somerset Cricket Club. So tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, you will see Remembering When. And the first edition is none other than Clarence Toppins Poffitt. Looking forward to that, Eel. And we the record holder for most wickets in cup match. Um, Poffitt is one of those ones that... Uh, has been a legend in, in his own right in Bermuda and over in Scotland, still coaching to this day. So um, we look forward to that tomorrow night. Um, well, guys, thank you very much. And folks, do enjoy the rest of your night from the Island Stat Sports Show. Have a good night. Good night.